Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining in tonight. Let's bow heads and pray. Precious Father, we just want to thank you for the gift of life. We want to thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together as your people and to come and listen to your word and to be fed by you. Father, we appreciate you. We appreciate all your goodness in our lives. Lord, by your power, we've been preserved. By your greatness, we've been preserved. By your mighty hand, you have shielded us from all the attacks of the enemy. Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord, tonight in Jesus' name. And so, Father God, as we go into your word tonight, we pray that your word will minister to our souls, minister to our spirit and our bodies. The Bible says you sent forth your words, and your word healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. As we listen to your word tonight, let every destruction in our lives be displaced in the name of Jesus. We receive from heaven above good news. We receive from heaven above the word of faith. We receive the word of healing. We receive the word of transformation. We receive the word of blessing. We receive the word of prosperity for the blessings of our souls tonight in the name of Jesus. For every here that be under the sound of my voice tonight, we pray God in the name of Jesus that we receive the word and let it enter into the, the right place in the hearts to bring forth fruit that will produce after its kind in the name of Jesus. And Lord, for every uh, one that shall be listening tonight, we pray that the evidence of the fruit of the word shall be seen in our lives in the name of Jesus. We, wish we would not just be an emblem showing people where to go, but we ourselves shall be the first partaker of the fruit in the name of Jesus. We put the devil under subjection tonight. We put him under our feet where he rightfully belongs in the name of Jesus. We silence the voice of accusation, the voice of the enemy. Tonight, in the name of Jesus, every form of distraction will put you away in Jesus' name. Lord, your word is already blessed and we receive it with, with gratitude tonight. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Once again, you're all welcome to today's Bible study. Uh, we, if you've been joining us previously, you will know that we've been talking about this uh, topic that the Lord has given us for this year, titled My Worthy Place. And actually, we are in the third month of discussing this, and we're looking at the fact that there is a place of blessing that God has prepared for you and I. And God's desire is that we should be really wealthy. And uh, don't forget, wealth is all encompassing. We're not just talking about money. But money is part of it. If you don't have money, you cannot say you're wealthy. So wealth in all aspects of our lives, being rich in health, being rich in, in the prosperity of our souls, being rich in money, being rich in moral fortitude, being rich in all things of life, being abundantly supplied by God. That is what wealth is all about. There is no doubt, none of us doubt it. Even people that accuse uh, uh, people of being a prosperity preacher. Nobody doubts it that God lives in affluence. I've never seen anybody who thinks that God lives in penury. No, we all believe that God lives in abundance. God lives in affluence. God lives in a majestic uh, uh, path of life or in a majestic manner of life because he owns all things. And so if we believe that, what do you think he has at the back of his mind for his children? Definitely lofty things and blessings and greatness and goodness and prosperity like we never had before. But we see that in the in this current world that we live in, that is not exactly what we see. Um, but that is a, that is that doesn't diminish the fact that God has good plans for us. And it is it is left to us to cooperate together with God, particularly as believers, so that we can be able to enter into what he has planned for you and I. And when we get there, it's a worthy place we get there in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go ahead tonight and start uh, by taking our um, Bible passage, which is taken from Isaiah chapter 51, from verse 1 to 3 and verse 16. It says, Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord, look unto the rock whence you are hewn, and to the whole of the pit whence ye are dead. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord, and joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody, 
and I've put my words in thy mouth and I've recovered thee and I've covered thee in the shadow of my hand that it may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, thou art my people. Amen. This scripture is all a compassion. It tells us exactly what's God's plan for our lives and what does God wants us to become. You see, God says he wants to bless us and increase us and enlarge us, but he says there is a prototype that we have to look to. If you're going to get the same results that he has at the back of his mind, he's shown us somebody, and who is our father in the faith, Abraham, that he himself blessed, he himself called, blessed, increased, multiply and made so great and he's saying that we should look unto him if we're ever going to be great and if you look unto him he said there is a purpose for that he said so that he may plant the heavens he may bring the kingdom of heaven to come to pass on earth hallelujah the essence of god blessing us and increasing us and multiplying us and prospering us and wishing that we had all the money that we could get in this world is because so that we can plant the heavens think about it who is going to feed the sick uh, who's going to feed the poor? Who is going to feed? Definitely not the bad politicians. The politicians want to squander as much as they can get and enrich themselves and enrich their family. That is the modus operandi of any politician, uh, or let me not say of any of most politicians. Uh, that is what they are all about. They want to get as much as they get, can get and can as much as they, you know, they can can right. So get as much as they can get and can as much as they can get. So we. No, that is not the blessing. That's not the way God works. God wants us to be rich so that we can take care of other people. We can bring his kingdom to pass here on earth and establish his goal here on earth. And that is exactly the reason for the blessing. But let's go ahead tonight. We talked about the blessings of God in the past and we talked about that that blessing uh, can be looked at from two perspectives. There is one blessing that was placed, placed upon mankind at creation. God blessed him. God, God, God placed a blessing upon mankind. And that blessing is still at work today, even the life of mankind. That's why man has dominion over every fish of the sea, over every fowl of the air, even the greatest and the strongest of all animals in the wildernesses. Man has dominion over them. Why is that so? Because of the blessing that was placed of mankind hallelujah so there is the original blessing of a mankind and that blessing speaks for things as we've talked about in the past it speaks about fruitfulness productivity increase and also it speaks about affluence right so those are the things that attach the blessing but beyond that um, after man fell god had to restore man back and it went through different processes of doing that but for now for this our dispensation and for this era that we live in God wants us to look at a prototype because man fell from the original blessing. So there is a prototype that is put in place for us so that we can be restored back fully. And that prototype is in Abraham. We have to understand it. Otherwise, we will be going through the route of the curse, thinking that we are trying to be enriched by God. No. The Bible says that it's the blessing of the Lord make it rich without having any sorrow to it. Proverbs 10, 22. We looked at that same scripture from uh, from NIV, and it talks about that the blessing of the Lord making rich without any toil hiding added to it. So we understand from what we talked about before that toil is the currency of the curse. It is our curse work. After man fell from the blessing and went into the curse, the way he makes things to produce is by toil, sweating to get things to work. Because the ground does not now naturally produces provision for mankind. Before the fall, the ground was supposed to produce provision for mankind. And mankind was supposed to work on the vision, not work on provision. Uh, you know, many of us today, and that is the, all of us inclusive, myself inclusive, we are working for our provision. That, but that is not God's desire. That is a result of the consequences of the fall. We are working for provision to meet our needs, to meet the needs of our families, to make sure we provide for ourselves, our families, and even some of our extended families and, our, and the less privileged amongst us. The reason why we do that is because of the curse. Under the blessing, the ground was supposed to produce for mankind so that mankind can focus on the job that it was given by God Almighty to do. Mankind was supposed to replenish the earth. 
and do what? Multiply the earth. The earth was without form and void. And God planted a garden eastward in Eden, right? He called the place Eden. And that garden that is planted, as we talked about in our previous teaching, was made in heaven and was planted there. And because it was planted, man was supposed to reproduce this same Eden all over the rest of the world. That was supposed to be his assignment, working on the vision, replenishing the earth, bringing part of Eden and expanding and expanding to the rest of the world. And then as he does that, mankind can fill the whole earth, but the whole earth will be like the garden of Eden. You see, that's why when God was talking to us again in Isaiah chapter 51, when he said that we should look unto Abraham, our father, he said that he may plant the heaven. That is the essence. The essence are, are from the beginning has not changed. God wanted to plant the heavens on earth. That's the essence. That's why he planted the garden as a seed. And mankind was supposed to take that seed and plant it to the rest of the earth. But unfortunately, we know what happened. Before mankind even began the story at all, he fell. And since the day he fell, he started looking for what, to hit, working now on provision. Under the blessing, that was not supposed to be. It was supposed to work on the vision that God has given to him. What was the vision? Plants the heavens. But now what we all work upon? Provision. That is the consequence of the fall. You see, when you restore back into the blessing and you will not be thinking about provision again because that will be met by God Almighty. And the way this happens is through Abraham. We're going to see that by you know, laying claim on Abraham's blessing and using his methodology of getting things done. That is how you enter back into that blessing. With Abraham not being the prototype. Hallelujah. We talked about it that because of the fall, the consequence of the fall is that the curse became the default. And what is the curse? You know, it was a sweat. You have to make everything to work by sweat, right? That was a curse upon man. You know, there are four levels of the curse. We already talked about it. There was a curse upon the animal itself, the snake or the serpent. There is a curse upon the relationship between man and the serpent. There was a curse upon the woman in childbearing and concerning the spouse. And there is a curse upon man. The curse that was placed upon man was that of toil. You know, we read the message Bible. It says that getting, getting food out of the ground would be as painful as having babies is for the wife. Right, and that is how it is today. You see how man struggles in order to make is to make ends meet, like we are saying, and in different parts of the world where we come from. When you ask people how are things going, they will say, "Go easy." Right, that is, it's not easy. That's what it's telling you. You know, it's never going to be easy if you are going to be working under the curse, and to work under the curse means to try to provide for your own needs by yourself. That's work working under the curse. It is never going to be easy. Never ever going to be easy we have to return back to the garden where god almighty is the supplier and the provider of our provision and while we can focus on the things that pleases god that makes us to help god plant the heavens when we shift our focus back to this resetting our perspective in life making god our provider and shifting our focus back to planting the heavens our needs will be ultimately met they will be ultimately net. That's what the Bible is telling us. I believe in Matthew chapter six or so. That's the seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and every other thing shall be added unto you. That is you seek God as your provider, seek his righteousness. That is try to plan the heavens. He says every other thing else shall be added unto you. What are those other things else? Those are the provision. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? How shall this healing come? What shall we provide for this? Those are the provision. And they are met in Christ when we take God as our provider. Hallelujah. So the fall of man is what may curse the default. That by all means, you see that you're always working for, for provision. If you don't take that conscious effort to come out of that and snap out of that, you're going to be working in curse. You will take three jobs in order to make ends meet. You know, uh, prior to the fall, we talked about it. The blessing was the default. That is, man doesn't have to struggle. You just have to focus on the vision and the ground produces what you want and what you need for life. All right. So, and we see that God has tried to restore man back through different dispensation. You know, we talked about a different dispensation. There are seven total dispensation in the era of mankind. I'm not talking about before mankind. 
So there is definitely God before man was formed. So we are not talking about the pre-Adamite world. That's not what we're talking about. So we're talking about from Adam till the known end of all things in eternity, uh, before eternity, sorry. So from eternity past, between eternity past to eternity future. So let's put it that way. Eternity is a long continuum, but God created time and put it right in the midst of eternity for us, mankind. God still lives in eternity. God does not live in time. You have to understand that. God does not dwell in time as we know it. Time is already relevant to us here on earth. You have to understand that. You know, uh, you see, when you go to different places in the world, you see that there are some things that are relevant to them. If you go to United States of America, they talk about social security number. In Canada, they talk about your social insurance number, SIN. Those numbers are peculiar to those countries. If you go to where I come from, there is nothing like that, right? There is no social insurance number. So if you bring a social insurance number from the United States, it makes no bearing there because they don't deal with that, all right? So different parts of the world, they have different things that they deal with or they have as a part of their own culture or customs or way of life. So the same thing, you see, mankind is a portion time. Time does not exist in eternity. So as far as we are concerned, so talking relatively to us right now, we're going to talk about eternity past before time was made and eternity future. Future eternity is after time has come and gone. You know, we can't comprehend it. Don't try to let your brain blow by trying to comprehend what eternity is. You can't comprehend it. God forever lives in eternity. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we talk about yesterday, we're talking relative to mankind as uh, yesterday because we deal with time. In eternity, there is no yesterday, there is no today. It's a present, continuous today. Hallelujah. So, but with reference to mankind, we talk about yesterday, we talk about years ago, we talk about million years ago, we talk about now, eternity, but no, but with God, there is none of that. So, because of time, there are different periods that God has tried to restore man within the time frame. When we talk about the speck of time, God has tried to restore mankind back to eternity, uh, to back to the blessing. So that was what brought about this different dispensation. We talked a little bit about them last week. And then we said, uh, God will teach a new dispensation. God resets the whole thing and pronounces a blessing upon mankind. That's what happened when he, when he, when he placed man, uh, when the divine, when the uh, dispensation of human government started, when he wiped out the whole earth with a flood and started with Noah all over again, gave him some laws and he pronounced the blessing upon him. That was, that was uh, another dispensation being set. And it's an attempt by God to restore man back onto the blessing. The dispensation of promise, the same thing. That was only unto Abraham. And it was God's attempt to restore Abraham back onto the blessing. And also the dispensation of the law, you see in Genesis chapter, uh, 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 it's not, not, not Genesis, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, where we read, uh, we try to understand what the blessing is from verse 1 to 14. It talks about the things that are going to bring mankind back to blessing. So it talked about it, they diligently obey and follow him, right? That these things are going to happen to you. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed out of the city. You'll be blessed in the, you know, the city. You'll be blessed. Your country will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. Your employment will be blessed. Your ground will be blessed. Your lifestyle will be blessed. Your gold and silver will be blessed. Everything around you will be blessed. Hallelujah. So if we follow after that, in that dispensation, mankind will be blessed. So it is God's attempt to restore man back unto God. So when it came to the dispensation pro promise, God took the responsibility so that it was no longer the responsibility of man to fulfill some certain conditions in order to be blessed. There is no doubt the harm of flesh does not prevail. In fact, the heart of man is desperately wicked above all, you know, that no man can design it, you know. So that's what the scripture says, and it is very true. If you imagine what people can think in their hearts and do in their hearts, you won't believe it, you know. So the heart of man is continually wicked that to satisfy the divine laws of God is just not natural for him. It is too foreign. And if it is to go by that, you go won't have people in heaven. Let's put it that way. Because it will only be people like, uh, uh, what's the name of this man? Enoch, that will be in heaven. If you're not Enoch, then you're going to always not be in heaven. So God took the responsibility and he did that with Abraham. He took responsibility for what man ought to do. And he said, all that man has to do now is just to do a believe. And so God now translated that because that worked very well. And because mankind was blessed under that, God taking responsibility out of his love. 
you know. And so God implemented the same system on that dispensation of grace, using somebody else as a sacrifice. Somebody had to pay the price for sin. Somebody had to pay the price for prosperity. God, somebody had to pay the price for everything we'll ever need. Even the curse that was placed on us. That's why we say Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth up upon the tree. That the blessing of Abraham may come unto us, the Gentiles. Why? Because Jesus paid the price. So Jesus had to pay the price in hard currency of his blood. And once, once that was done, there is nothing else left for God to do but to say, paid in full, the blessing is again into action. But what has mankind got to do? Believe. So under this dispensation, we see that the goal of the whole thing is for man to be restored back to the original blessing. That is the goal of the whole thing, that man may be restored back onto the original blessing. And the price, like we said, that was paid was the blood of Jesus. It is through that blood that you're redeemed from every sin that you committed, a past, present, and future. All your sins are dealt with by that blood. It is through that blood that not only are your sins forgiven, but you are justified. That is, you have made like you never sinned before. Not only that, it is through that sin that you are redeemed. That is, somebody paid this price so that you can be translated from being a child of the devil and now adopted into another family. So you redeem. Somebody redeemed your life by, by, by trading your life with his own life. So you redeem. It is through that blood that our sicknesses our, and our diseases were also healed. It is through that, that same blood that every curse and that writing of the enemy that is written against us are blotted out. It is through that same blood that though he was rich for our sake, yet he became poor. That what we might be rich in it, that we might have that prosperity in him. Hallelujah. It is through that blood. That blood, that precious blood of the land. It is that blood that provides for all of our needs. And all of our needs are taken care of under that blood. That is the precious blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross of Calvary for you and I. That blood is so powerful. That's why we sing the song. What can make us holy again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can say, you know, take our sins away? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. If we can't deny it. It's the blood that takes away all these iniquities of ours. And that's why we can call him Father because his blood has washed us clean. Hallelujah. And now the currency, when we talk about the currency, the currency is your ability to be able to buy something. What represents or translates into your ability? We all know that in the United States of America is the US dollar. In Canada is the Canadian dollars. In Italy is the Italian lira. In US, in uh, United Kingdom, that is a great British pound. In, Euro, in European countries is the euro. When you get to those countries, you need to trade whatever you have for those currencies. Otherwise, you won't be able to buy and sell. You can't participate in that economy. You may be living there. You can be in the United States, but you'll not be able to buy anything if you don't have the currency, either in cash or your ability to be able to use your credit card to pay for it so that it is translated. If you have a credit card that they don't exchange currencies, then they won't accept that. So even though you are in that country, how true is this for many believers? We are in the country of God as it were. And we still don't benefit out of all these things. Why? Because the currency that we use in the country and the kingdom of God is faith. If you don't have that faith, even though you are there, you can't participate. You cannot partake out of the healing that Jesus paid for. It is by faith. You cannot participate out, even out of, you know, the only thing that makes us even become the children of God in the first place is by faith. The Bible says, for by faith are you saved through grace. Right? It tells us that that faith is not of anything of our own. Lest anyone should boast, right? He says it's the gift of God. But if you don't have faith, which is with the heart, man believes it. Right? Unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. If you don't believe in your heart, that is a faith, you still cannot be saved. If you don't believe that Jesus did all these things that we talked about, you still cannot be saved. Hallelujah. But once you believe it, then you are saved. The same thing with healing. The price has been paid, but we need to believe it. The same thing with prosperity, healing, wealth. 
whatever God has provided for deliverance from the power of the enemy, whatever God has provided for, once you believe it, you will totally be redeemed from the power of hell. Hallelujah. So we need to believe this. We need to believe it. And the currency is faith. That is a means of transaction. That is how you buy things in the kingdom. If you have your faith, you can get anything. And this translates to prosperity as well. It's not money that you need in the realm of the spirit, right? The problem with many of us is that we don't recognize, we don't realize that money is not our problem. It is faith that is our problem because faith will produce money. Many people are busy chasing wealth all around. They're working three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten jobs if possible, right? We don't understand that it is a blessing of the Lord that make it rich. If you have the faith, the faith will produce the money. If you have the faith, the faith will produce the money. You know, I, I was looking into a program yesterday. It's called, uh, maybe it's, maybe this will bless somebody. I don't know. Uh, I'll just mention that. Uh, there, there is this um, uh, Joseph Business School started by Bill Winston. They teach entrepreneurship and they teach business leadership from the Bible. They use, they merge the wisdom of the world with the Bible, using Bible as the predominant force. And I just went to their website to search if they have any program very soon and all that. And then I saw the testimony of a lady. She said when she started a business, she had one truck and she was struggling. She actually could make business, uh, hands meet. But since she did the program and they taught her how to declare the word in their business and taught her how to put spiritual principles into manifestation, now she has over seven trucks and she's about eating the goal that is set for them in the program, which is making their one million dollars within their first year. He said she's on her way to eating one million dollars. When I heard that, I'm like, was it not the same woman what changed attending the program and getting what into her faith into her? The problem had never been the issue of money in the first place. The problem was the fact that she didn't believe, even though she was living in the kingdom, she didn't have enough faith to be able to translate the power of God into manifestation to produce wealth. Then she joined the program. She learned about declaring the word of God over the business. She learned about declaring the faith and using her faith and all that. She learned about business principles and started practicing those. And before you know, she has seven trucks now all over. And she's about eating a one million gold target. Hallelujah. The word works. The word works. Absolutely. The problem is never with the word of God. The problem is never with God. The problem is always with us. Do we have enough faith? The faith is a currency of this kingdom. Faith is what's going to produce the car for you, not your, not your, not your, uh, your salary. Bible says that it will supply your needs according to your salary per month in Christ Jesus. No, that's not what he said. He said it as according to what is riches in glory. If we can hanker our faith to his riches in glory, it can produce anything. And you know, God is not lacking in anything. What is his riches and glory? He made all in all, so he can provide anything for you. You know, I'm trying to emulate people that have gone taking giant strides, uh, 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 that are taking giant strides and in the Lord. And, you know, I don't condemn them. I want to do exactly what they did. People don't have any money and yet produce something out of it. You know, you know, uh, Kenneth Copeland, great example, is bought many jets. You know, the man has radical faith for, for finances. He believes God for anything. Jesse Duplantis, you know, Jesse Duplantis will tell you how God taught, taught him and God told him he wanted to give him this and he wanted to negotiate with God about <laughs> that. Yeah, I don't think I want that, <laughs> right? And then God told him, all I needed to do is believe. I didn't ask you to pay for it. All I need to ask you to do is what? Believe for it, not pay for it. Amen. Uh, Kenneth uh, Degan usually said, he said, when he went to places to minister, and he's believing God for something. And maybe the man of God over there has accidentally asked him and said, how much uh, would you need to meet your need to meet your budget this week? He said, normally we avoid telling people, but one man of God kept asking him and pestering him. Eventually he mentioned the money. He said the man almost fainted. And the man said, we can't give you that kind of amount of money. We don't have it here. You know, he said, I didn't, I'm not asking you to give me the money. You are the one that has kept pestering me how much would meet my budget this needs. Then I told you, you almost want to faint. 
And he said, the man told him that, I don't think we can get such a money for you. We can't even get it. He said, you see, the, the highest money we ever raised in this church was for a missionary that came here and needed money for Zuzu. And it took me 45 minutes to raise that money. And now you're saying you need times three of that? He said, there's no way we can get, there's no way you will get that in this church. He said, he said to him, I'm not asking you for it. And I'm not even asking you to believe for it. Please don't believe for it. He said, all I want you to do is when you put out the plate, just tell everybody this money is for Brother Hagen. Don't even see anything. Don't even psych them to give any money. And he said he was surprised. The man did exactly like that. He just went and said, the plate is for Brother Hagen. Whatever you want to give, God bless you. And that was it. He said, but he held. He said he told the man, please don't believe for it. Because he knows the man is not, cannot even believe for it. He cannot. He yeah, was waiting, working in great unbelief. But he doesn't want somebody else applying the bricks against his own faith. So that's why he told the man, don't even worry about it. Don't believe for it. He believed God for it. And of course, the money was provided. You know, uh, case surprise, believe when he wanted to get his first Lincoln Navigator, he was believing tremendous for it. His car was rickety. His old car was very rickety. His two kids have had accidents with the car. And they're not two kids, two daughters. One hit it on the side, one hit it on the back. So it was rickety. Yet it went everywhere preaching the prosperity. And it was believing God for a new navigate, new Lincoln Navigator. It was a cream de la cream in those days. That that's the top of the top line. You know, eventually he got a Rolls Royce through the same principle. Kenneth Hagin said it the same way. He said the same way I got my first house. He got it with no money. But he started practicing with a car. When God told him he wanted to bless him with a car. You know, he learned the principles of God, excise faith for it. We can't talk about all this within this short period. You know, but what I'm trying to say is that faith is a currency for producing in the kingdom, not your ability according to your ability. No, God is not supply your needs according to your ability. If you're already trying to pay for it, you're working in the wrong. You're not working in faith. Let me put it that way. You're working according to the system of the world, according to Babylon. You can work to according to Babylon. There's no nothing against that. No, nothing against that. You can strategize your way, like I, I keep saying all the time, you can buy five condos in 20 years. You can do that. Just move from one to the other. You just be between 7.5K uh, uh, dollars, that's $7,500 and $10,000. That's all you need to pay every five years. Be moving to another one, keep moving to another one. That is the system of Babylon. It will produce. But if you want something beyond what Babylon can produce, you need to exercise faith. And there is no limit to what God can do for you and I. No limit. You know what the limit is? Us. Us. Bible says, now unto him, Ephesians 3, now unto uh, Ephesians 3, 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly and above. Can you hear that? Exceedingly, abundantly, and above. All we can ever ask or think. Whatever you can think about, whatever you can ask about, he can do beyond that. So what limits him? We are the limitation because it's going to be according to our faith. Be unto you according to your faith. Can your faith draw out a cup from the kingdom or all your faith can draw out is a system of the world, the Babylonian system to work for you? Is that all? Then you have to wait for time. If you exercise the, the faith, you exercise another kingdom. That is not based on time. You exercise eternity. And so success can come out without time. You know, you can continue to invest carefully and do all that. And you still make it big in life. You can do that. There are people that invested their way into prosperity. Yes, they did that. Right? But you can also believe God for the same thing. And God will compress time for you. Such that he will give you the ideas. Look at Jacob. He worked for 13, 14 years, working the Babylonian system. He didn't produce a dime for him. They gave him the fake wife first. And that's what the Babylonian system always does. People pursue the Babylonian system in a haste and at the peril of their souls. And only to get fired from the job or they get, even if they are not fired from the job, they, the hand, when they get to the end, they now see that the end is not, there's nothing special about the end. There's nothing really special about it. But when you engage this kingdom of God and the principles of God, it produces without the toil. Without the toil. 
That's what happened to, him, to Jacob. The same thing he did. He didn't have to do anything extra. He was always feeding the animals. That's all he did for Laban, taking care of his stock. This time around, what happened? Revelational insight from heaven above. When he activated the kingdom of God, the angel of God appeared to him by night and said to him, gave him some tricks and some things to do. And when the animals came, what did he do? He put, you see, that's when, when, when Laban came to him and said, uh, gentlemen, um, I don't want you to go yet. Just name your wages this time around. I will pay you. <laughs> the gentleman laughed and said, Jacob said, no, don't pay me. I don't need that again. You see, if you ever run uh, after pay, that's what you're going to run after for the rest of your life. You better learn to exercise your faith for prosperity. You better learn to. You better learn to. The man smiled and said, don't worry. I'm going to do it for you for free this time around. Let's do it this way. How can, how many of us, even in this generation, despite all the genetic modification and all that, the things that we do, how many spotted cows have you seen? They're not a lot. How many plain cows have you seen? Lots of them. Go to Northern Nigeria, go to where places where they breed lots of cows and all that. You will see brown cows, white cows, black cows, all kinds of, you know, plain like that. Before you see spotted ones amongst them, very few. So he told this gentleman by the name of Laban, he said, well, this is what we're going to do. The spotted ones, when the cow give birth, just give me the spotted ones. And you take the plain ones. Laban laughed, you are done. <laughs> I would even have paid you higher than that. But there is a revelation from God. He's working under the covenant. Under the covenant. And the covenant produces. Now it's not running after the pay again. Is now running after covenant. You have to exercise your faith in Christ to make the word to work for you. It is not your salary. Stop running after a job from job to job. There is great insight for witty inventions. There is what? Great insight for witty inventions. And not only that, don't forget says, thou shall remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. That is the purpose. He gives you the power to get wealth. If there is no power to get wealth, you have to keep walking the Babylonian system. And the table is already screwed against you. It's already skewed against you, rather. Right? If you're trying to walk the Babylonian system, the devil is the head of the Babylonian system. You think he loves you? He doesn't love you. That's why you see all the people that have been given wealth. Who are they? Unbelievers. People that can use it for his glory. People that he can command. He cannot command you. So how will he deliver such money to your hands? He's not going to do that. You think he's going to give you money so that he can use it to go and build more churches? He's not going to do that. Or you think he's going to give you more money so that he can go and rescue those who are, who are, who are fatherless or who, are, who need money for hospital. He does, he's not going to do that. He's not interested in that. He's not interested in that. He wants as many people as possible to come to hellfire. So he's not going to make a mistake. It's, it's against his own interest that you are rich. So if you keep engaging that Babylonian system, you will move forward. There's no doubt about that. But you're not going to be rich like God designed for you to be rich. You're never going to get there. So that's why we have to wake up. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we have to do what? Wake up. Babylonian system cannot deliver anything to your hands. It cannot deliver to my hands. It cannot deliver to your hands. We have to take the wisdom for great insight from God. There is a spirit in man and it is the inspiration of God that giveth them understanding. If we can engage that spirit and exercise our faith, we get anything we want here on earth, anything, because our needs are met according to his riches in glory, not according to our salaries, not according to our pay, not according to our jobs. Speckled animals, give those to me. And you all know the rest of the story. He began to do what the angel showed him. And before you know it, when animals gave birth, the strong ones were speckled, the weak and the feeble were what? We're playing. 
soil that at the end of the day, even the children of Liban saw it and say, ah, this man has taken away the wealth of our fathers. Very soon it shall be said of us that we have taken the wealth of the land away in the name of Jesus. I receive it, Lord. Very soon it shall be said of me that I have taken the wealth of the land away. When did they come to this town? These immigrants, how come they have so much money like that? That shall be my testimony in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. But it is only possible by what? By the currency of faith. We draw out from that resources in heaven. Not by working the Babylonian system. The prototype is Abraham's blessing. That is the model for which God wants to bless me. It's by Abraham's prototype. And you saw Abraham's prototype. He didn't do it by himself. There is nothing that is called oil in it. You saw that. That same, that same covenant was what spilled over to Isaac. That when there was famine in the land, was sowing in the land, I was reaping. When there was no rain. The same thing went to, uh, to Jacob. When Jacob already exhausted his own physical means of doing things and nothing was producing. And then he entered into that realm of the covenant of his fathers. You had better be Jacob today. We have struggled and toiled. Isn't that what we have all done? We had better be Jacob today and realize that there is more to life than all this struggle and toiling and all the things that we do. Right? Enough wages to retire. Peter had him one day, one day, one day. And yet he's been farming and fishing all night. And he's been doing that for many months. But enough wages. He retired immediately. That's why when Jesus told him to come and follow him, he didn't think about it. He thought he was a stupid man. You know, sometimes we don't read the scriptures with perspective, with a little bit of insight. How do you think he was putting juju or some black magic into his mouth and just calling people, follow me, follow me? No. Peter is a calculative person. He has responsibility to look after. Imagine somebody just walked to Calvary and just tell you, tell you, follow me. Leave everything you're doing. You want to ask him questions twice. Do you have enough money to take care of me? You want me to go and join you in this ministry? This is my view. You would be honest. I want to work for you. I want to work for God. I have that for God. But do you want me to do this free of charge without working? I don't mind helping you on the side, but that's not what Jesus demanded of him. But that miracle that night was enough for him to retire. Great cash that he could never caught in his life. If he had debt, everything was taken care of. If he had mortgage, it was paid. He had more than enough to supply the same thing with the widow of Zarephath. We can keep mentioning examples upon examples. The same thing at the married feast of Ghana. Ghana. Right? The same thing at the feeding of the 5,000 people. What you have is not the problem. What they had there was five loaves of bread and two fishes. Right? But when the grace of God came upon it and they eschewed the Babylonian system, you know, the but disciples were still thinking according to the Bible. They said, where shall we get food to feed all these people? Hmm. That's what killed them. Even if we go gather money together, a penny, what, whatever they call it, it's not enough to feed all these people. They are still thinking Babylonianically. <laughs> Put Babylonian to say that. How is that the way we think? We can't go for the good things of life. I'm not saying that you go into debt, but can't you believe God for it? Can't you believe God for it? You know, you can believe God for it. And God will tell you exactly what you need to do. Sometimes they see the need to sow. That's all you need to do. That's all you need to do. That's all you need to do. That's all. Just put the seed into the ground and let the seed come up. That's it. But you have to have faith for it. You have to learn to believe God. This is not what you have that is not enough. It is your faith that is not enough. It's your ability to believe God for the very best and God to be your provider and for God to be your source that is not enough. Check it into your life. I'm not talking only to you. I'm talking to myself as well. We need to check into our lives and see the places where we are falling and doubted the things of God. It is not that the God of our fathers cannot do it. It is because of our faith and our trust in him to be our provider and to be the source of all things for us is very limited. If Isaac didn't have to do what Jacob did 14 years to go and get a wife. He didn't have to do that. 14 solid years. He was working fully in the blessing. And part of working fully in the blessing is listening to God, right? Because when there was famine in the land, he wanted to go into Egypt. God told him, don't go there. Stay here in this land. And when, they, I mean, they were all farmers. Stay here in this land, do what? I'm going to farm then. 
<laughs> and then he put his seed into the ground. What happened when he put his seed into the ground? There was no rain. Everybody was mocking him. How would you put your seed into the ground when you see there is no rain? But when the harvest came, all of them shut, shut, shut down and they came begging for, you know, they brought all their money. That is how wet transfer happens. That's how God made him rich. When he sold and his rip, he filled ripped a lot of things and they came out, all oh, there's no have. What's going to happen? They're going to bring their money to buy. That's how he got all their money. They brought their money. Whatever was the currency they were using in those days, I believe it must have been gold and silver and all that because they don't have the kind of paper money we have now. They bought all their gold. They gave it to him and he gave them in exchange for their gold. We are take. Give them what? Food. That's the same wealth transfer that took place in Egypt. They brought everything. The rest of the world brought, brought everything they had for food. Great wealth transfer. Hallelujah. So you have to understand, it is not about what you don't have. It is about developing our faith for prosperity. And how can they believe if they have not heard? That is why it's important. And I keep saying it. Don't miss all these teachings we are doing. If you miss it, how can you develop the faith for finances? For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not going to come upon you because you believe in God, because you read your Bible or something like that. You need to be inspired. You need to listen and be blessed. Just the same way you listen and you were saved. The same way you can listen and be prospered. You can listen to the word of God. You can listen. Come, come keep joining us every Tuesday. As we bring, keep broadcasting this word of faith. Wealthy place. If you do this throughout the rest of this year, I can guarantee you where you're going to be. Because the word of God cannot fail. You will develop maintenance faith to believe God for anything. For anything. The problem is not within. We are the problem. Our faith, our, our faith is too small. We've got very little faith. In fact, very weak faith. In fact, we've got no faith at all. You know, because if you still have a faith as little as a mustard seed, you can still make it work. But the problem is, how come ye have no faith at all? That's what he told his disciples. <laughs> how come ye have no faith? That is the issue. Many of us don't have faith for prosperity. We have enough faith for salvation. That's why we're saved. Some of us have enough faith for healing. That's why when sickness comes, you know how to dust it off. But faith for prosperity, majority of us don't believe it. We just trust God to provide us a job to provide us our money. No, that's not faith for prosperity. Your salary is already limited. If you're a salary earner, for most people, they can never, ever become a millionaire. They never, never, ever. It's not going to happen. Because you're already determined with what you have. And you have equivalent expenses. For most people, at least their expenses are equal to their salary. For most people. If not, the other way around. Right? If not, that the expense is more than their salary. And that's why we have credit cards. We have line of credit. We have mortgages. We have this. We have that. All the extra funds that we use to back ourselves up. It is because our current expenses is more than what we can pay for out of our own pocket. That's the reason. Nothing bad in asking for a loan for mortgage. That's not what I'm talking about. Don't get me wrong. We could, that could be the place where we start. I don't think I can, I mean, where I am right now, I don't think I can trust, I, I don't, let me put it that way. I don't think I have enough faith to say that I'm going to buy a $5 million house without any any loan whatsoever right now. At this stage, I'm not there, but that's where I'm developing to, I'm going to get there, where I can exercise my faith like all these men of God say, and I can say, well, yes, I'm going to get a $5 million house next, you know, next spring, you watch me. And they're going to be paid in cash. You watch me. But will you start wherever you are? Keep believing God for it. Bill Winston said when they first got the place where they are right now, uh, about $5 million or $4 million uh, that they needed. And they couldn't even get a mortgage. They exercised their faith upon exercising their faith. They had to postpone the closing. And then he went back to God. God told him, you know what to do. He said, what should I do? He said, you know what to do. He said, so is it? He said, yes. He said, how much? God told him, they're looking for $1 million for, for down payment and they have saved some money. He said, God told him 400000 He said, I almost gagged. <laughs> he said, but God, we are trying to get that money together to pay down payment. He said, we should give out 400000 <laughs> He said, you almost gagged. But he, he obeyed, he did that. And before you knew it, 
they got a small bank, give them a mortgage, and that was it. But the next property they were going to buy, he thought it was going to be through the same way. God said, no, no, no. You have enough faith to believe for this. Don't go get a mortgage for this. We develop from faith to faith. But we need to start from somewhere. So faith is a currency of this dispensation that we are in. We need to develop our faith. And how can we develop our faith? Remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This kingdom, this dispensation works in by faith. We need to believe what God has told us for uh, from this word. The word of God calls us the blessed. It calls us the rich. It calls us. It ca calls us that we are going to. We are prospered. We would have great wealth. We have great innovations. Great wisdom for wit inventions. We have the power to get wealth. He told us that we're going to spend our days in prosperity and our years in pleasure. He told us from his word that when men are saying there's a casting down, we will say there is a lifting up. He say, told us from his word that we're empowered for prosperity and that we receive great power for tremendous prosperity through his word. I wanted to believe that and believe that that is it and believe God for the impossible, believe God for the uh, for that which you cannot achieve by yourself. If you can achieve by yourself, why are you abusing faith? That is not faith. That is just walking by sight. If you want to get a home right now and what your salary dictates that you can get a $200,000 home, yeah, that is, not, that is not faith. Yeah, you will come and give testimony, God gave it to you. We understand that because God gave you your job. We understand that at that level. But that is not faith. Your faith didn't produce anything there. Your faith did not produce anything there. But of course, I know we have to start from where we are and keep developing. You know, but the house where we are in right now, you know, we didn't get it cashed out, which we did, right? We still had to pay. We still had to get a mortgage for it. But we still exercise some degree of faith. Why? Because when we went to the place, my wife loved it so much. My wife didn't, my wife was just like, we have to get this place. And that was in January. Of course, in January, we had no time to put that for anything. In fact, I wouldn't even qualify for a loan even if, even if we applied for such an amount of money. So we wouldn't even have qualified. So where did our faith start from? First and for foremost, unfortunately, I, I, I'm sorry for those who have the home, but <laughs> that is the advantage we as a believers. I've just placed an embargo on it. I placed an embargo on that home. Nobody else is buying it. I declare it in faith. I placed an embargo on the home. Nobody else is buying it until I'm ready. We left it there. That was in January. In April, we sort of went back to them and asked them, can you consider maybe renting this house out? We can rent it and then subsequently uh, just transition and then get a place. Oh, they said, no, we're not getting it. Nobody's buying it. We already placed an embargo on it. So if you're not getting it, that's your own headache. Then a month later, when we have a little bit of money and... Uh, uh, we financed what we refinanced one of our homes that we had for investment property. We financed the thing, brought out some good cash out of it, and then um, and then went to the bank. The bank we knew they were not going to allow us to load. <laughs> we already beyond our levels of uh, we be, it was way beyond where our salaries were at that time. So we exercised our faith for it that it's going to be approved. The mortgage worker that we used uh, worked directly with the bank. Uh, we worked with RBC, so we just went straight to RBC. There is no point going to to uh, to a, a general mortgage broker because we even our last property, our last investment property that we did was trouble before we could even get it approved because uh, they were like, we are leveraged, we are over leveraged as it were, you know. So this time around, we just took the same property. I'm like, I'm just going to go straight to our bank and we just went straight to RBC, we gave it to them. And the mortgage broker, to give it to the bank, the bank rejected it. They were like, no, they are well, well beyond all the TDS and GDS and everything. And the, and the mortgage broker returned back and said, yes, we know, but this is going to be a personal home. Plus, this guy is going to be able to afford it. You can't say he cannot afford it and then he treat it back. Eventually, they approved it. The mortgage broker himself told us, said he couldn't believe that they approved it. That's what she said. She said she did not believe that they would ever approve it. She was thinking they are going to ask us to go and bring more down payment. That's what that's what is trying to fight with them eventually. That when they return it back, I said no, they won't. Then it's going to say, okay, what if they increase their down payment? So that was what she was waiting for. But they approved it. You know, 
Why? We, we exercise our faith for it. This that one is not going anywhere. We already placed embargo on the house. The house has been sitting down for five months. That was in May. From January, before then, it's been sitting down in the market for almost eight months or something like that. And it wasn't a useless house. It's a show home. You know how a show home is? So it wasn't like a home that was built. Show home has every detail you can have in it. So the home is a show home. That's why when my wife saw it, she was in love with it. Everything was made to perfection. Everything was, you know, they put extra into everything. And so she was so much in love with it. And then when we were ready, we refinanced the house. We got some money out in April. In May, we applied for it. And we stood our ground in faith. This is going to be it. And when they returned it back, the mortgage broker said, congratulations, you now have the place that she didn't believe they would ever approve it. TDS was for 70%. You know, TDS says it has to be 30 or 30 or 35 or whatever it is. TDS was 70%. And they gave one instruction on it. They said, never, ever come back for any loan. I said, that's your own headache. <laughs> we already have this. Don't come back for any loan. That's your own headache. When I'm ready for another loan, I'm coming back. <laughs> you can't start against me. Why? Because I believe in faith. Of course, when I'm, not, I'm not asking to walk dangerously and recklessly. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that your faith can produce. Your faith can do what? Can produce. Your faith can produce and it will produce. Hallelujah. So remember the currency for activating the things and the kingdom of God in this kingdom is faith. That is how you get things. That's how you get prosperity. Not what? Not your money. At least that was my own little victory. That's why I shared it with you. And we're trying to develop even faith bigger than that right now. We're trying to exercise faith even bigger than that. We want to use faith for bigger things. For example, the bank has said, she don't come back for any loan. And I've not gone back since then. It's almost two years now, and I've not gone back for any loan whatsoever to them. But very soon, I'm going to knock their door, and they have no choice. They have to accept. Because you can't stop me. Hallelujah. You know, we exercise faith. We're going to work. It's God supplying my needs according to his riches and glory, not according to what somebody else is saying. Not according to what. You just exercise your faith for it. Believe God for it. If he has to make the sun to stop for you to win, he will do it. He did it for Joshua. He will do it for you. If he has to do anything, faith is what pleases him. Our ability for us to believe in him, to meet our needs and do the things that we heart want from him, is so much pleases him. His pleasure is to be believed. His pain is to be doubted. You believe God, you give him pleasure. You disbelieve him, you cause him a lot of pain. Hallelujah. God will help us now. We're going to stop there. It's a, I wish we could continue. I wish we could continue. We have lots of things we're going to share together. I encourage you, please keep coming. You're going to be richly, 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 richly blessed. You just keep coming. Hallelujah. Let's take our confession tonight. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, you can join me as we take our confession. God bless you. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. I abide under the shadow. I see of the Lord. Is my refuge and my fortress, my God, my in God in my surely he has delivered surely me from the fear of the Father and from the notion of the He has covered me with his feathers, and under his wings shall I trust. His truth shall be my shield and walk I shall not be afraid of the terror by night, of the, for the arrow that fly by day, nor for the pestilence that walk in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes in the day. A thousand shall fall at my side, and ten thousand at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because I have made the Lord, who is my refuge even the most high, my protection. No evil shall befall me. For he has given his angels charge over me to be all my ways in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let's take our 2021 confession. This is my year of divine healing, divine health, divine restoration, divine prosperity, divine protection, and abundance of the flow. Yet 2021 shall hush me into my wealthy place. I shall rise on eagles' wings. I shall spend my days in prosperity and my years in pleasure. I shall suffer no physical, material, financial, or spiritual loss. No evil shall befall me. 
Night I shall any play come near my dwelling. Favor shall attend to me in all that concerns me. Behold, I shall call a nation that I know not, and nations that knew me not shall run unto me because of the Lord my God. And for the Holy One of Israel, the Lord my God, for he has glorified me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's share the grace together in fellowship. <coughs> now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the may love the of God, of Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship the of the Holy of Spirit, Lord, and the rest in the life with us now Spirit, and forevermore. Us now forevermore. Amen. Surely, Amen. God's goodness Surely. and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, us. and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. Amen. Amen.